money, right, to have a session that's called tackling coloniality in ed tech and restoring ed tech and then start with all kinds of technical issues, right? <laughs> so the tech host is having technical issues, right? My co-host, my co-presenter is having technical issues and she's messaging me on WhatsApp. <laughs> so to start with, apologies that um, Taskeen is late, but uh, she and I created this presentation and hopefully she'll be in soon and um, can host that with me. But I always think it's funny, right? Uh, Murphy's Law, laws to talk about ed tech and think about it and then have ed tech be like, really, I'm not sure I want you to talk about me in you know, the critical eye. <laughs> you know? um, but yes. So this session is, um, as I shared, is tackling coloniality in ed tech and uh, restoring ed tech. And I would just love to really start with, as I in, and get into um, showing you a bit about what, what we've, we've got planned for today, is to just listen to what your intentions are coming into this session. What are your curiosities and questions? Like when you, I'm always empathizing with the audience of the Reimagining Education Conference because there's a lot that happens at every block and I'm always curious about what, how do people, you know, when people actually choose to invest their time in one session out of four or five parallel sessions, I really take, don't take that lightly at all. I feel very humbled by it. Um, and so if you would want to drop it in the chat or unmute and start sharing, what are the curiosities and questions you're coming with um, to this session? I was just drawn. I actually, it's funny you ask because I, I just got back from bringing my son home from our, our uh, program. Uh, we, we homeschool, but we, we, we had a, anyway, it's, a, it's called Spider. So we were one around and then I said, oh, I have this meeting at 3.15 and I went quickly went and I went, I can't remember which one it was, it was that one. And that's all I know. <laughs> so something in, in how you described it, really uh, I'm drawn into it. So I, I just want to learn more and I just love chatting to everybody or hearing everyone. Fabulous, you're welcome. What else? Let me pull up my chat to see if there's something. And it's okay if you can't stay all the time. That's also welcome, that's fine. Um, whatever time you can um, share with us. I was compelled by the last story, the last question in your description. How can we hack our technologies to serve the aims of decolonization? But I must admit, I'm actually more curious about decolonization as a concept as a whole than the specific role of ed tech. But I think that in this day and age, we kind of have to look at both together. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll talk a bit about uh, also decolonization as a whole and as a movement. We'll get into that. I'm, I'm glad we have that plugged in. Any other shares, questions, curiosities? Yes, Renee, please. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm really fascinated about the intersection of these things because I, I as in like, can we <laughs> do? a reimaginative decolonial perspective on education and employ ed tech how do we do that how do we mm. do that consciously and critically and creatively and with and i don't i i basically spend a lot of time um critiquing <laughs> the technological aspects and ed tech and just and i'm i'm because I'm I'm much more interested in these other ways of reimagining education. And so I'm like, wow, if these can merge together somehow and actually coexist and support one another, I'm very much interested in how that comes together. That's awesome. I'm just taking notes of all of that. And it's, um, yeah, I ask myself the same question sometimes. And sometimes I even think, is it, is it actually even, is it actually even possible to, circumvent or avoid, or um, I guess, go around ed tech altogether. And I often find myself thinking, uh, I don't know, I'm not, I don't think so, <laughs> at least at where I am right now in my journey, right? Um, and it almost feels like a very powerful moment. Um, powerful with all what comes with the word powerful as in both, you know, the whole spectrum of positive and negative of like influential, but also at the same time really scary about how ed tech is, um, 
coming into all aspects of our life. It almost feels like a moment with the modern schooling moment where everybody is like in schools and that's like a whole global parameter for the world. And then now it's like everybody is part of this ed tech revolution, right? Um, anyways, please come keep other parts coming into the chat. Um, and I'm so glad my co-presenter Taskin is with us right now. Uh, and Taskin, I started by saying it's just only funny that when we're doing a, a session on tackling coloniality in ed tech and restoring it, that you know we have all kinds of technical issues trying to log in. So <laughs> welcome on board. Hi everyone. Thank you, Nari, for um, holding support while I was getting on. Um, no, it's absolutely. so lovely to see all of you here. Um, yeah, it's really, really such a special occasion to to be able to present to all of you. Um, Nari, shall we kick off? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, folks, um, what we're thinking about is uh, to talk a little bit about uh, just generally this idea of decolonizing. Um, starting from decolonizing in general, but also then zooming in a bit into decolonizing ed tech. Um, Sorry, would you like me to share my screen? I'm happy to. Are you, oh, oops, yeah. sorry. Um, is that good? Okay, yeah, okay, that's better, yeah. Cool. I, um, yeah, so decolonizing in general and decolonizing ed tech. So there'll be a, a few pieces of us sharing a few things. Taskeen and I work at um, two places. One is called Open Development and Education, and another is called EdTech Hub. And both are interested in this idea of thinking about EdTech um, on different levels, whether it's on um, formal schooling levels, um, non-formal schooling levels, government levels, community levels, um, and thinking about it with many different hats, one of which is from a decolonial perspective. Um, and how can this be part of the global conversation as well? So we'll share a few frameworks around that that we're working with um, that we're hoping is helpful, but we'll keep our talking to a limited time. And then the idea is to just get into um, lots of sharings with all of you, uh, including some breakouts and a design activity that we're hoping uh, could be fun and generative uh, around this very idea of you know, the second part of the title, which is like, how can we hack and re reimagine the story of ed tech uh, from different angles, okay? Does that sound good? Thumbs up, questions, beautiful. Okay. So, um, Taskeen, I'm gonna give it over to you. Sorry, this, um, yeah, you can go ahead. You're muted though, Taskeen. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to say, Nari, do you want me to share my screen? Because I think um, the view that you have it shared in is also showing our. I don't know if I can share, but if I have those slides, I'll be able to. Otherwise, I'm happy. I'm happy for you to share. If you can just go into it. So I stopped sharing a while ago. If you wanted to share, but uh, let me let me. Oh, just... I, I need I need host uh, right. Okay, yeah. then let's. Okay. I would say let's let's, let's just... just keep going. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, maybe you can go to the next slide. Yeah. It's a little. Funny. Okay. All right. So um. I think it's all, like I often tell the story by telling everyone a little bit about myself. So in my background, but I'm from South Africa. And um, for anyone who knows about South Africa, South Africa has sort of these two histories. It's the country with the highest Gini coefficient in the world, which means the highest level of inequality. So you have one part of the country who is, or not even po like pockets within the different cities, you know, living in luxury. And then the other half of it sort of, living in abject poverty. And these are all histories of uh, colonialism and apartheid um, within the country. So going on to the next slide. Um, where, when COVID hit, right? And I think that's where this like spur for ed tech and online education came through. Um, we really saw this inequality being ex exacerbated between the richer and the poorer communities. So 
Um, these are just some of the articles that I captured during that time in South Africa, where um, there was so much going on in terms of, um, you know, how COVID-19 is highlighting the challenges of online teaching and learning and how when we're coming back to schools, it's not to just opening schools, but opening schools justly. Um, just sort of really unpacking how how these inequalities had manifested within the teaching and learning space. So um, if you go on to the next slide, um, what, what I saw, and at that time I was in South Africa, and you, you kind of saw two worlds emerging, right? Um, on the one side, especially within my job in ed tech, some of the questions, and I'm sure all of you experienced this, right? Were like about um, what, what platform should we use? Should we be using Teams or, or Zoom or this or that? Um, what online proctoring tools should we use? How do we do digital technology? Um, um, you know, what video conferencing platform? Um, and those, those were some of the questions on the one side for people who, who to which access wasn't even an issue. And then on the other side, you had issues like access to electricity and devices and um, uh, the internet. We had challenges with data costs or sharing devices within a family. If the if the mom needed to use a phone for work, then, then the kids couldn't learn at the same time. Um, and even things outside of the tech space, like, like for example, many school, uh, many kids get food when they go to school. And if they're not going to school anymore, how are they going to get their daily nutrition? So there, there were a lot of things that, that surfaced. And so if you move to the next slide, um, that kind of just kind of give the background of the inequalities that um, I wanted to talk about today. And my my background, my PhD was on looking at the imbalances in in um, sort of open education and in MOOC spaces. And so what I just talked about was almost what I would call like material or resource injustices. But the, these type of inequalities go way beyond that to like like um, epistemic and knowledge imbalances. So. Um, and so many of you would know about open educational resources. And when you look at who creates those and who receives those, you'll see that actually most of them, 89% of them come from Europe and North America and only 1% comes from Africa. And the same with things called massive open online courses, right? Most of the producers of these, especially on Coursera and FutureLearn, um, you know, come, for, come from you know, the global North and only very few of them are, uh, are actually black on the on to, you know just to be frank if even if you just look at it even in within the US um, context so so there's these really big inequalities in terms of who is um, creating the you know online education so going on to the next slide um, this is where like coloniality and decoloniality come in so. Coloniality, and I'm using the definition, I always use this definition of Maldonado Torres because like he just says it so perfectly that like I, I wouldn't be able to describe it better. And he talks about coloniality being different from colonialism, right? So colonialism, you could say officially ended or political emancipation when countries are now a sovereign state, but coloniality refers to the long-standing patterns of power, um, these define our culture, our labor, our relations, our knowledge production. So basically it's like, you know, what is the culture that's maintained alive in books, in our academic criteria, you know, to submit a journal article. In, in, uh, like, and the one I love is like how, how we aspire to ourselves, what we think is good behavior, or bad behavior, or culturally acceptable behavior, um, common sense, all of these things stem from this idea of coloniality. And so decoloniality, which is kind of what we're focusing on here, right? Decolonizing um, talks about dismantling these relationships of power and and how and these conceptions of knowledge. So who decides what is some, something that is knowledge versus culture um, or academic versus just spiritual or things like that. So going on to the next slide. Um, when we bring this idea of decolonizing into education, what does that actually mean, right? So we, you can talk about reclaiming our identities, our languages, our cultures, our lost humanities. Um, it's really, really about going beyond diversity and transformation, which is, a, which is the language we often use um, in spaces. Like diversity 
is very different from decolonization and difference, right? Which is truly getting to the root of is the issue and not just an ameliorative, not just a, a surface level um, attempt to, to um, improve things, but actually really getting to the root cause. It's also problematizing the, the Eurocentric prisms um, that like that these discourses can face. And really it's about dealing with like the emotional harm about creating a plurality of voices and really about creating a critical consciousness. Um, yeah, so on to the next slide. Um, there can be multiple meanings of decoloniality and here yeah, I'm not gonna unpack them too much, but basically there's different understandings and we, what we wanna emphasize is that decoloniality doesn't mean the same thing to everyone. Rather, it's about dismantling these relationships of, of um, power and inequality. Um, but different groups and different indigenous knowledge groups might ac actually have conflicting um, ways of how that injustice um, may be solved. And I think it's really important to point out. Um, next. So digital neocolonialism, and that's kind of bringing us to our topic today. This is about these same ideas of, of um, de decolonizing, but bringing them into the technology space. So how can technology be used as a form of indirect control over a marginalized group? And in this case, it might not be uh, a nation state, but it could be a tech, a tech company, right? And it might not just be um, you know, about land, but about data. So these things have, have really um, changed over time with digital neocolonialism. And next. Yeah, um, and so when we talk about the colonial elements of edtech, what do we actually mean, right? So, so there's a few core principles. So the first might be this idea of globalizing education, right? So the standardized education from MIT or Harvard that gets spread around the world. Um, it could just be the philosophies, the epistemologies that we that we um, privilege. So often we see in what we what we um, think and do is that rationalistic, secular, objectivist, written, behaviorist forms, individualistic ways of thinking are promoted and the ideas are spiritual or ancestral or subjective and critical and communitarian ways are often othered, right? Like, oh, that's nice, but that's for your personal space. That's not for something that you bring in to, to the idea of education. Um, there's also dom dominant languages, the core to periphery models from you know, the global north to the global south, um, different colonial logics that can actually be embedded into algorithms, reinforcing algorithms that can you know, impact um, marginalized groups negatively. There's a great book called Weapons of Math Destruction. If anyone's ever read that, it's really good. And then adverse incorporation, when, when students who, who might be economically disadvantaged have no other way to access education except through um, these platforms. And so they'll opt to do a, a digital personalized learning app, right? But they kind of have to sell their data to get onto that. So yeah, so those are just some, I'm just throwing out a lot of ideas at you to um, spark some thinking for the conversation today. Um, I think that's it, right? Okay, the, the, the probably, <laughs> This is this is the part I should have remembered the most. Is like the dimensions of human injustice, and this was kind of the the conceptual framework that I used in my my PhD. And I think it's a really useful analytical tool to un to unpack injustices within a system. So, um, first on on the top you have also on the left. Let's start with material injustices. So often when we talk about inequalities. Um, we talk about it at this level, about resource, about access, and those sorts of things. And those are really important, but really that's the first step, right? We then get to cultural epistemic injustices where some knowledge groups are dominant, are dominant over others, um, especially in wiping out their histories or their values or their narratives or their worldviews. And then political and geopolitical injustices, which relates to that court of periphery imbalance um, uh, but it also talks about like racial, sexual, gender, geographic, spiritual, or linguistic hierarchies. So today, as we go through this, this, the discussion, I want you to keep these in mind. Um, so I think we'll just have a quick reflection se session. And since we're a small group, I would love it if you could unmute and, and just share for yourself. 
um, just based on this framework that I introduced now, what material, political, and epistemic? So epistemic means to do with, you know, to knowledge and understanding um, what knowledge is. Um, injustices, have you experienced using any type of um, educational technology? Um, so please feel free to dip in. Uh, that's a lot in a very short time. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. I, I'm not uh, speaking, I, I'm not, um, uh, so I'm, I'm an artist and I'm an educa educator or, or a performer. Uh, we use art uh, to, to bridge gaps in voices for those that don't, that don't get a voice here in Canada. Mm -hmm. And there's much to talk about, but I keep thinking of the indigenous uh, people. So when you mentioned South Africa, which my, my in-laws are from, and very supportive and, and uh, amazing. They left South Africa uh, because of apartheid. And fast forward now, I'm married to their son. Um, <laughs> but our, our indigenous, um, and I've been there and it's amazing. I can still hear the oceans, it's beautiful. So uh, right now, I just wanted to bring it in. The Sunshine Coast, uh, as this, this, the, the, the nations across Canada are going through uh, uh, like the, the children of the residential schools that, that were missing and, and, and um, murdered are being found in graves. And they're doing more, more ac and, and just in our own nation here, uh, there has been findings. And I bring this up because it's, it's real and our, our indigenous population is treated very similar to, to the uh, South African, um, uh, uh, the, uh, that, 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 that division between power. So everything you say, so I'm looking at the cultural optimistic injustices right now. And myself as a Métis uh, woman, uh, mother, it's, it's just, um, I see it all. I, I could talk a lot about that. Our organization uh, has coined the phrase decolonizing creativity because everything you just spoke about is really, really, what is creativity? What is theater? What is dance? And it comes from top down. So I'm looking at from those lenses and I'm going to. That, that's, that's such a, that's such a useful thing to share. Um, it really reminds me of something in, in South Africa, the, the, the Khoisan, which was the, the indigenous population in South Africa, they got together and um, developed these sort of um, research, a code of research ethics about how people should study them. And, and they kind of, it, it was such an important movement because they sw switched it around. It's like, if you want to research us, this is what you need to do. Because they, you know, they, they were like the hot thing to research. Everybody wanted to go and understand this indigenous group. And yeah, I think I, I found a, a paper on it. You can read it to your chair. Um, but yeah, let's let's move on. Any any other any other thoughts before we move on? I think when you when you mentioned MIT, I just um I feel like I don't how do we say this? Um it it did kind of go, oh, um, I have done a very yeah, I had I was involved with a moog moog, is that what you call it? Um that came out from MIT and um, I think what I find, um, what, you know, do you call it a, a part of coloniality is this, this, um, uh, take, taking, um, some, some, some element of some ancient, um, wisdom, um, or that, that has been kind of uh, very universal, almost like um, uh, for people, you know, people's for people everywhere, um, and and then kind of um, packaging it in um, a, a kind of we're gonna um, transform the world for good. Um, and 
yeah, I did when you did mention um, that uh, kind of spirit uh, spirituality is is kind of it's 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 <laughs> it's kind of it's got to um it's got to it's um it's got to be effective um <laughs> yeah so I do find that interesting especially since that move that I'm move or whatever I'm talking about was was very much within this kind of world of like um understanding of systems and complexity um and yet I do find I'm especially because I'm, 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 I'm very, I'm, a, I'm kind of very religious person. <laughs> like I'm, I'm deep in a religion. And so I do find it very interesting that, um, yeah, it's like, it's just, uh, it's uh, re reductive. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say briefly that yes. it's a pretty interesting topic because, um, here in America, we are now experiencing, um, different types of controls on what is being taught and how it's being taught. And so I find uh, this, uh, <laughs> I find myself very advantageous to be here and, and, and be a part of this because we are currently dealing with this particular issue right here in this country in 2023. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks all. These are really, these are amazing reflections and I think they're day in and day out questions as we all deal with um, ed tech tools that are all our, that surrounding all of our lives, right? The commercialization of sacred knowledges. The idea of that at some point, it's not even going to be government officials that are telling us uh, what to teach or what not to teach, but it's actually going to be the algorithms um, saying that the, the learning of the machine is gonna better tell us what is personalizable to every person of us, right? So these are really questions that, you know, are really <laughs> bothering us and we wanna share them with a lot more people. Um, and, and reimagine what we can do about them. I wanted to share also um, in just a few minutes, if you, I would say guiding questions, maybe we have pitfalls here on, on, the, on the slide, but I, I would really just say a few guiding questions as we think about an ed tech tool or an ed tech project and, and analyze it. So I would say um, there's like three lenses to look through. Um, one is this coloniality that comes on the level of assumptions and worldviews, one that comes into the process of design, and another that comes on the process of actual implementation. So worldview, design, implementation. So one is like this assumption that is, you know, being propagated in our world that technology is going to be the key to fix the broken education system. You know, just give every kid a laptop, give them access to all the information that the world has produced. And I hear this sentence a lot, also not even in mainstream education. I also hear it a lot in our alternative circles, right? This device that we hold in our hands has all of the world's knowledge. Just give it to a child and they're gonna be able to navigate the world. Um, and I guess the question to ask here, I'm just gonna focus on the question always, which is right here. Does this educational offer assume that the only barrier to improving education is just the lack of device penetration or just the lack of access to information? Um, so it's a question to ponder here. I guess another pitfall is that journeying through a learning pathway is to a predetermined goal addresses educational needs. Uh, so this idea of that, you know, uh, most of the MOOCs or the, the things that are designed over um, internet and, and given as a prepackaged right thing is it's what kind of pedagogical underpinnings is it built over? Is it also built over this idea of that um, there is a particular learning outcome that citizens, learners, kids have to reach, but instead of having this outcome be through textbooks in schools, they're just being through nicely looking infographs and animations and clickable games and things like that, but we're still guiding people through the same quote unquote learning outcomes. So that's a, an idea to think about. What pedagogical underpinnings are embedded in this educational program, uh, even when it's using EdTech? Um, I'm not gonna go through that, but it's in the slides and we'll send you the slides. And those are a few pedagogical underpinnings that um, you can think about. Another pitfall is 
EdTech designers are often a, hom a homogenous group catering to diverse students. So this is where we go into the design process, right? So this idea of like, who actually designs these programs? Who designs these MOOCs? Who designs these apps? Who designs um, these programs also that gets implemented in schools? And the question is like, it's not only about the color of the people, it's not only about their nationalities, it's, it's, it's rather also, because they could be tokenistic divers, right? They could be a bunch of all kinds of different races, but at the end of the day, they have been groomed by the same Western universities and the same Western educational mentality that, you know, me not having a white skin doesn't mean I don't think white, um, you know? So, so the idea is, the, the question is the designers, the implementers, how are they engaging the users in the, in the conceptualization of their product? How are they engaging the users in the design and the development beyond just user testing, you know, beyond just thinking about users as those, you know, I don't want to use the word lab rats at all, but it's like, you know, this idea of just like something to just test our product on so that our product can scale more rather than design for the people and with the people, right? Fourth is about algorithms, right? So we're also into the design process. All this, there is a machine behind everything that we're receiving as content right now in ad tech. So the question is like, how is this machine working? Who's programming it? What kind of, and also this machine learns on its own and develops on its own. It has a life of its own. It's not like there's always someone who's also feeding in the algorithms. The algorithms learn by themselves and grow out of human control completely. So the question is like, what logic do these machines grow with um, that is programmed within them, right? So our learning materials, platform designs, algorithms made open. Do we know how our algorithms are designed and programmed? Do we own? the mechanisms and the means to reprogram these algorithms, right? Um, and fifth is opting out of data collection is often a false choice. And this is uh, when it comes to implementation. We all sign on all kinds of accept all cookies when we lo log into any platform, um, agree to terms and conditions. None of us you know, knows what's in those terms and conditions. Our data and our digital footprints is everywhere in the world. Uh, there is not only a digital footprint, but an accompanying ecological footprint. And I definitely want to acknowledge also that we're using Zoom here, which is both a commercial platform. It definitely belongs to an international neoliberal company. It does have a large ecological footprint. Um, I'm not saying let's not use it, but we could also think of open source platforms, but we also could just think of anything else. Um, so I just always, and I, I'm not trying to say there is anything that's good or bad. I'm always trying to say that the paradoxes are, are inherent and there are benefits that we're getting out of the Zoom. We're meeting and talking, you know, and learning. So it's just always more complex, right? And so again, thinking about user data, how is it collected? Where does it go? Who is it sold to? How can we opt out of it? Um, you know, are all questions to also think about. Okay, that was another bunch of like, through a lot of things, but we'll make the slides available. Um, but what we'd love to do right now is to give you um, probably only 10 minutes, uh, Lauren, sorry, but we'll do only 10 minutes in breakouts. And what we'd love for you to think about is those three uh, perspectives that we talked about, which is coloniality in assumptions and worldviews. Right. I'm going to come back to these slides again, but, you know, the idea of an assumption or well, the value level, the design level and the implementation level the use. Right. So we have three guiding questions on the slides and um, we do have I'm going to change this to 10 minutes. Um, we do have a jam board for you, which has those three questions that are on the slides. I'm going to drop. Uh, the link to the Jamboard in the chat. And as you go into your breakout rooms, we'll ask you to open the Jamboard um, and choose a type of ed tech to, to reimagine, thinking about those three questions. This type of ed tech might be a learning management system. It might be, you know, uh, Beth, it might be the learning management system that your school is using with your family. It might be a MOOC, you know, something like what you've shared. Um, Mo uh, or Mel uh, around, you know, the, the MOOC that you've taken with MIT, or it might be an online conference, just like the reimagined education it might be um, a learning app, 
And think about it in terms of those three questions on the level of values, design, and implementation. Um, please take notes, and we'd love to have you share back with us as we come back to plenary. Great, we are back. Um, and the jam board is here again in the chat. Do we have everybody from all of our rooms? Okay. I think everybody is back. Yes. Um, yeah. We don't have a lot of time left to the end of our session, but we'd love to take some highlights and shares. Uh, and yeah, who would like to share? Main highlights, uh, perhaps an idea that you've captured together about a reimagining of a particular product or implementation. I feel like Lauren was mid-sentence in our group, so maybe, sorry. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll finish. Finish. Yeah. Oh, 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 even just finish and then I like maybe comment on what you. Uh, I think I think a lot of where we were taking some of our information was how is that information being shared, what sources is it coming from, and then the opportunities for it to be implemented. It, it also tends to be a problem. And as I was finishing up, when we look at every time we add these changes or these modifications to the education system. It now becomes a product, which becomes a bottom line, which means, you know, it, it, it's no longer about the, the, the care of the quality of the information to be shared, but the material that we're going to compile in order to afford somebody the opportunity at this learning experience. I can I can share that the, the question of relationality came strongly in the breakout room where I was attending this idea of the relation the re, the relationship with the non human and how to how to create relationships with technologies and how can they be common property rather than private property and there was almost like this idea of just the the privatization of like technology being a property right like Camille Camille you shared this thing where like everybody has to have a cell phone versus like if a village has a cell phone. Uh, and what would that mean? And what relationship would it create around the device, for example? Um, it's just like an interesting thought. Um, the, we've written some blogs on the topic and a lot of what we presented today stems from these. So you can have a look at that. We've also started a Zotero library. So all like resources, um, you know, it could be videos. I think Ecoversity's resources are also on there. Um, you know, if you want to look at this topic of decolonizing ed tech and then, yeah, a couple of, of um, other links and resources to previous talks or um, slide decks if, if you want to like think about this idea a bit more. Um, yeah. Um, basically, I actually came into the session hoping that like I've been like talking with people about this already and like so I wasn't there's no answers here and I, I guess I'm not expecting you to give answers but do you, do you the two presenters do you have frameworks that you have developed that you're using is it in your publications is it in your academic work what kind of frameworks are you using and what kind of like do you have like yeah what, what have you developed around this like for actually evaluating things on our own and cre and critically I can go first. Like my, so I shared one of them, which was the three three circles. Mm -hmm. Um, and that framework was um I can also not even can you find the link to the to the conceptual frameworks slide deck that we just did? Um so okay, so number one, that framework. Number two in my thesis, I actually developed this framework for approaches to designing justice oriented online educational courses, right? So it kind of takes us through the similar steps that we went through in this talk today, right? So understanding assumptions and design and actual implementation. So we have those frameworks and then the slide deck has a bunch of them gathered from different scholars, um, like social justice frameworks and some are tech specific, some are general, but you can apply it. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I guess because like the slides go fast and like, so I probably missed a lot. So if <laughs> To have access to those would be great because I would love like how to have something I can use as an evaluative framework for things and you know obviously yeah. not work on my own ideas but to have a, a starting off point. So and please, if you build on it, get in touch with us. Tell us what you're building with it. You know, we'd love to to be an open conversation. It's not really fully developed products yet. Uh, 
but please, if you build on it, add it to the Zotero Open Library, et cetera. But I really want to thank yeah. everyone. It was so valuable. Um, thank you for the space and thank you for yeah choosing to spend your time with us and share with us. Really looking forward to continue the conversation. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was really such a pleasure learning from all of you. Um, okay. We have such rich experiences to share with us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Much love and blessings. And everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening or your day.